it's a beautiful day here at Soul Farm. It's um, a little bit hazy, but it's cool, and it's a great day to get out for vinyasa flow practice, which is what I'm going to do and share with you. Now, this practice has a theme, and the theme is um, going to be looking at one of the principles or laws of nature, the law of efficiency. Um, this is uh, the principle that nature follows and the way it expends energy uh, and expends its energy in the most efficient way possible. So if you think about, say, a predator out on the hunt, like a lion, um, he or she doesn't waste a lot of energy on the hunt. They tend to be very pinpointed with their efforts, um, saving their energy for when they need it the most. We should be the same way with most of our activities, certainly with our vinyasa flow practice. We should never feel depleted at the end of our practice. Instead, we should almost feel re-energized, like we're using our yoga practice as a way of building energy. Um, I know in my day-to-day -day life, I don't know that I follow that principle very well. I spend an awful lot of energy um, probably trying to avoid discomfort trying to avoid doing things. I also spend a lot of energy trying to make decisions. Uh, what's important to do? How to get things done? What I'd like to do with this practice today is teach us some ways to be very efficient with our energy and eliminate some of the decisions in our vinyasa flow practice. Um, the placement of things. Just make it very clean and simple. And the idea is that every time we come to our mat, we do it the same way. Um, certain things, not everything. And um, it brings a certain efficiency uh, to the practice so that our body doesn't feel depleted at the end. And it helps to create more of a clarity in our mind. So join me and we'll explore ways uh, to work with that principle here. So we're going to start at Tadasana at the front of our mat. So place two blocks at what you consider to be the front of your mat. And we'll start by setting our feet up hip distance apart. Now here's one way that our body proportions can help determine. So this isn't a decision. This is just using our natural body to determine what hip distance apart is. It's not your outer hips because that can certainly change over time, right? We can fluctuate. Look at your two ASIS bones, so the front parts of your hips, the pointy parts, and imagine a straight plumb line down. Now, then you bring the center parts of your feet. Center parts are where the second and third toe meet, and imagine a racing stripe down the centers of that to your heel. And align that, just kind of eyeballing it, so that your feet centers are underneath your two hip bones. Now here's a little bit of trivia that's kind of interesting. This may or may not be true for you. I suspect it might be. If you take two fists and put them together and bring them right to the fronts of your feet, you'll find that they will fit nicely right in that spot. So this is one way that body proportions can help when you're trying to figure what hip distance part is. All right, so find your hip distance apart and do it at the front of your mat. And before you do that, imagine a racing stripe. We're gonna call this like a starting line at the front of our mat. Three inches from the front of the mat. You can even put one there if you're so inclined with maybe a piece of masking tape. So align your big toes, the very tips of your toes with that racing stripe, hip distance apart. Now, for the purposes of this class and for most vinyasa classes, one of the first things we do is we step back. We take a big step back. So starting from the center of your mat is only going to cause you to expend energy as you have to move forward and reestablish yourself to have space behind you. So we're going to start right away knowing that we need to be aligned at the front of the mat. Then find your Tadasana mountain pose. This is where you make your feet very big, wide, and long. Press your feet and your fingertips down and lift your low belly, the crown of your head up. Close your eyes for a moment. Once you've found hip distance, it can be helpful to take a moment and just really feel this in your body so that you don't need to go through those processes every single time you begin your practice. Then open your eyes, inhale, lift your arms high, 
exhale, soften your knees, bring your fingertips down towards the mat. And with soft knees, relax spine. Just let your arms dangle, relax your neck, and feel as though the weight of your head, your relaxed arms is helping you to create space between each vertebra, decompressing your spine. And then start to stack your vertebra from your tailbone up, one by one by one, slowly rising. And as you come up, Bring your shoulder blades together and down. And again, press your feet, your fingers down, your low belly, and the crown of your head up. Let's do that again. Inhale, arms reach high. Exhale, soften your knees. Take your fingertips down to the mat. Dangle for a moment, getting a stretch in your spine. Then start to stack your vertebra one by one by one, rolling all the way up to standing. And again, find your mountain pose. Let's add on. Inhale, lift your arms high. This time, interlace your last three fingers. Extend your index finger. I'm going to turn so that I'm facing you. And we'll laterally flex the spine. So arc over towards the right, opening up your left ribs. And then inhale, back up to center. Then exhale over to the left. And inhale, back up to center. And this time, as you exhale, soften your knees, hold. Now, you're three inches from the front of your mat. As your fingers come down, align them with your racing stripe. So your fingers and toes are all up against your line. Take a big step back with your right leg. Now, big step, what does that mean? If you scoot your foot back to the point where you feel as though your heel is aligned over the center of your foot, and you begin to feel a stretch in the front of your hip, that's probably a good stance. This is a long step back. Then grab your blocks, bring them back so that they're behind your front heel. With your fingertips on your blocks, lift your heart. Remember, your blocks are an extension of your arms. So if they're forward, you're gonna need to lean forward and maybe even slouch. Instead, we wanna have a proud open heart Looking forward, extend your back leg as straight as you can. And then let's extend our left leg towards straight and bend and just move fluidly like this a few times. So creating some heat in your hamstring, your quad, beginning to stretch the front of your right hip. The next time you bend your knee, pause. Using your blocks for support, step your right foot forward. One step if you can, aligning your toes with your other foot, bringing your blocks forward, and take your hands to the mat. Everything's right on that imaginary racing stripe. Bring your hands to the shins, lengthen your spine. Keep some softness in the knees. Many times people straighten their knees, but then need to round their spine as their hamstrings aren't quite long enough for this. So we want to lengthen the spine almost to the point where we feel a stretch in our front body. Fold, bring your fingertips down to the mat. Inhale, lift your arms high to the sky. Join your palms at the top. Glide your thumbs to the heart. Let's repeat that on the other side. Inhale, arms reach. Exhale, fold, fingers come to the racing stripe. Step your left leg way back. Long stance. Scooch your foot back until your heel is right over the center of the ball of your foot. You do this keeping your right knee bent right over your heel. So these are all body proportions indicating where we should be. Grab your blocks, highest level, move them behind your front heel, lift your heart, extend your back leg very straight. Then let's build some heat in your right leg by bending and extending your knee straightening it to any degree that you comfortably can, keeping your back leg also as straight as you can. After we've done that a few times, just hold the bend of your right knee, using your blocks for support, step your back foot back. See if you can do this in one step. Plant your foot right next to your right foot. 
Bring your hands to your shins. Lengthen your spine. Exhale, take your fingertips on the racing stripe. Inhale, arms reach high. Join your palms at the top. And as you exhale, glide the thumbs to the heart. Now let's do that again with a little different movement in our lunge. Inhale, arms reach high. Exhale, fold, fingers touch the starting line, right leg steps back. This time, keep your right hand on the mat. If the mat's too far away, just take your block under your hand, lengthen your arm. Keeping everything very long, lift your left arm high into the twist and lower. We'll just do this a few times. Inhale as you twist and exhale as you lower. I'm offering that breath pattern. If that feels awkward to you and you want to change it, go ahead. Just make certain that it's an intentional change and that you are paying attention to the breath. Use your core muscles, the muscles wrapping your waist, to squeeze you into the twist. Take one more repetition. Lower your hand and then pivot to face the long edge of your mat. If you've got one block handy, that might be all you need because all we're gonna do is turn our toes out and take simple side lunges, opening up the inner thighs. Back and forth at your own pace, at your own dop. One more bend into the right knee. And the next time that you bend your left knee, pause and just pivot back forward again. Now let's use our blocks to support us as we step the right foot forward, place it right on your starting line, hands to the shins, softness in the knees as you inhale, create space from your sternum to the pubic bone, and then exhale and fold. Inhale, lift your arms high, join your palms at the top, and as you exhale, glide the thumbs to the heart. Now I'm gonna turn so that I am not facing away from you on my side lunges on this side. I'm gonna find my imaginary three inch from the front racing stripe. Feet hip distance apart. All right, inhale, arms reach. Exhale, fold. With your fingertips aligned with your toes, step your left leg way back. So long stance, so scooch until you feel as though your heel is over the ball of your foot and some resistance in the front of your hip. Up this one, we'll plant our hand either on a block or on the mat. Inhale as you lift your right arm towards the sky and exhale lower. And do this a few times. When we warm up, we're sort of uh, not just warming up the muscles and creating heat, but also exploring and looking at the kind of body we're bringing to the mat. So if there's any injuries, stiffness, things that you should know, our warm-ups are a good time to explore and look for those things. The next time that your right arm lowers, pivot, face the long edge of the mat, and turn your toes out. And again, take side bends, and you have an option to create more heat by using your upper body and your leg strength to support itself. Maybe um, airplane your arms, or just take your hands to your heart rather than supporting yourself on a block. So one more time, take a bend into your left knee and as you bend your right knee, grabbing your block, pivot to face the front of your mat. Check that your right foot is a little bit off center to the right. Step your left foot forward and place it. Bring your hands to your shins. With soft knees, lengthen your front body. And exhale and fold. Inhale, lift your arms high to the sky. Join your palms and glide the thumbs to the heart. I'm going to move back to the front of my mat as we continue. So, aligning with your racing stripe. If you found yourself migrating away, find the racing stripe again. Perhaps ask yourself, why? Did I migrate? How did I get to a different point? And then let's move on. Inhale, lift your arms high. Exhale, soften your knees. Plant your fingers, aligning your fingertips with your stripe. Step your right leg way back. Find your long stance. Scooch until your heel's over the center of your foot. Now, move your left foot 
towards the center. So it's aligned right in the center of your mat between your two fingers. And without shortening or lengthening, plant your back foot. We call this heel to arch alignment because if you had a racing stripe down the center of your mat, lots of racing stripes, the heel would be on it as the arch of your foot. Then lift your upper body, bring your hands to your hips. This should be a good stance for a warrior two pose. Hopefully you've found your long stance and your goal is to get your knee over your ankle and your thigh is perpendicular to the mat as possible. So that's something that you're working towards. It may not happen right away. Pause, see how successful you are with the stance. If you feel like it's helpful to widen your stance or if you're not feeling stable and you'd like to shorten your stance, do that now. Check that your knee isn't moving back over, away from your heel, but rather staying right over it. Extend your arms, turn your gaze over your left hand. Breathe here in Virabhadrasana 2, Warrior 2 pose. So there's not a lot of negotiables. You start with using your body proportions. And if there's something, a tightness, say for example, um, if you're feeling overstretched in your outer ankle, if you feel as though your inner arch is pressing into the mat, that's a good signal that it's time to shorten your stance. So even though our body proportions may set us up somewhere, injuries, conditions might require us to make some adjustments. Then take your hands back down to your mat, lift your back heel. Move your left foot a little to the left and step your right foot forward. Bring your hands to your shins, lengthen, and then take an easy fold. Lift your arms high to the sky, join your palms, and glide your thumbs to the heart. I'm going to change sides so that I don't have my back to you. You stay where you are. Inhale, arms reach. Exhale, fold. Take your fingers down where? Right to your starting line. Step your left leg back. Find a long stance, scooch, until you feel the beginning of a stretch in the front of your hip. Move your right foot to the center of your mat. Without shortening your stance, plant your back foot heel to arch. Windmill or your left arm up and over. Bring your hands to your hips for a moment. And then check that your knee it's right over your heel. Check that your outer ankle doesn't feel overstretched, that your arch is still able to stay lifted. If those two conditions aren't met, you may need to shorten your stance a little bit. And if you're feeling like you're not challenged and your front thigh is not coming parallel to the mat, well, then you can widen your stance a little more. Then lift your arms, gaze over your right hand. The idea is that we make these decisions once, maybe revisit them as our practice uh, maybe gets stronger or more flexible. But every single time, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Bring your hands down to your mat, align your fingertips with your big toe. Move your right foot a little bit to the right. Step your left foot forward. Bring your hands to your shins. Inhale, lengthen. And exhale, fold. Inhale, lift your arms high to the sky. Join your palms. And exhale, glide the thumbs to the heart. Let's move on. Inhale, arms reach. Exhale, fold. Fingertips to the starting line. Right leg steps way back, long stance. Pause for just a moment here. So we can use our long stance is uh, setting our baseline, but that doesn't mean that we aren't sometimes going to use a short stance for a pose. If we start here with the long stance, we can look back and create a short stance by simply moving our foot forward about eight to 10 inches. Then move your left foot towards the center of your mat. Plant your right foot so you have heel to arch alignment and rise. 
So now I've created a short stance. Short stance is about one leg's width, one leg's length rather, between my two feet. So if I point my toes forward, I've got an equilateral triangle formed with my legs and the ground. You stay with your foot pointing towards the short end of the mat and then begin to lower your left hip and create length on your left side. Reach, keep lowering your left hip until you feel as though, okay, I've met resistance, maybe in this hamstring. Resist the temptation to lean forward. Instead, keep your torso, your shoulders, right over your left leg. Take a big reach, 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 and then without dropping your shoulder, bring your hand wherever it goes. This doesn't mean you have to stop here. So if you've always felt that the goal was to get your hand down to your ankle or to the floor, just release that thought right now. Instead, your goal is to create a lot of straight lines, and that includes your spine. So your legs are very straight and powerful. Your spine is long. If you cheated, either by leaning forward or arcing over, you're missing that opportunity to get these long energy channels along the length of the spine. If you wanna go deeper, you can do that simply by dropping your left hip a little bit more and lifting your right hip. The thing that will keep you from going even further in the pose will probably be this muscle here. It should feel as though there's tension and that it's just not gonna release anymore. And that's fine. You know you're getting the job done. Extend your right arm high to the sky you can look forward or up. If your balance is compromised, by all means, look down. So reach in all directions, fill out the pose. Then bring your top hand back to your hip. This, by the way, is Trikonasana, triangle pose. Look down, bend your left knee, bring your fingertips right to the very front of your mat and step your back foot forward. Bring your hands to the shins. Inhale, lengthen your spine. Exhale, fold. Inhale, sweep your arms high to the sky. Join your palms and as you exhale, glide the thumbs to the heart. Trikonasana on the other side. Inhale, arms reach. Exhale, fold. Fingertips touch the mat. You know where they go. Step your left leg way back into your long stance. This is setting your starting position. Then it's a very simple thing to look back. There's not a lot of decisions to be made. I'm gonna shorten my stance eight to 10 inches. Align my front foot on the center racing stripe and plant my back foot heel to arch. It's almost as though you're on a balance beam. Lift your torso, turn your heart to face the long edge of the mat. Straighten your knees completely. Sometimes people aren't aware that they have a softness in their front knee. Make your legs very straight. Then start to lower your right hip, lift your left hip. Reach, reach, reach your right hand. The more you tip your pelvis, the more stretch you'll feel in your inner thigh, that's what you're going for. Reach, 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 and then without curving your spine, you can say, I'm gonna imagine there's a, a, a pull right under my armpit so I can't lower my arm, uh, armpit, just my arm down, that's where we go, okay? Once your hand is on your thigh, there's a possibility you can tip your pelvis even more, accessing a deeper stretch in your right hamstring, Notice your back foot. If it's turned out or forward, you might feel um, a little lack of mobility. Experiment with pushing your heel, pivot your heels a little more away from you. And that may buy you a little bit more ability to tilt your pelvis. And then lift your top arm high. Gaze is either forward or up or for balance down. Breathe here, Trikonasana, Triangle Pose. 
and then look down with your hand coming back to your hip. Bend your right knee. Plant your fingers on the mat. Move your right foot a little bit to the right and step your left foot forward. Bring your hands to the shins. Lengthen and fold. Lift your arms high to the sky. Join your palms and glide your thumbs to the heart. Lower your hands, pause in Tadasana. Let's move on. From the front of your mat again. Inhale, lift your arms high. As you exhale, soften your knees. Bring your fingertips down to the mat. Align your fingertips with your toes. Step your right leg back into a long stance. We have a change here. Plant your hands completely and step your left leg back until you come to the top of a push-up. Remember to separate your shoulder blades and tuck your tailbone towards your heels. Your shoulders will be aligned right over your wrists and this should be a pretty comfortable top of a push-up. It shouldn't have required a whole lot of hand to foot adjustment. Now on your next inhale, lift your hips into an upside down V shape, like a pike shape. This is downward facing dog. For 90% of you, I'm not sure about 90, but I think that's probably accurate. The hand and foot position you found in plank will be exactly perfect for your downward facing dog. Come forward into your plank again, tucking your tailbone towards your heels. That should feel good. And then lift up to your down dog and notice how hopefully that feels good too. Now it's not to say sometimes people don't need to make a little bit of an adjustment, but too much of an adjustment will probably bring you into too short of a down dog. You might need to really round your spine or too long of a down dog. So let's play back and forth with this plank to down dog using that hand to foot position to find your own body proportions. And if we move this, we'll also be building some strength, some flexibility in the shoulders, warming up our shoulders a little bit more. The next time you come to down dog, pause, soften your knees, Let's actually take the knees all the way down to the mat, but don't change anything else. Keep your hands where they are, keep your knees where they are. What you'll find is this is not a perfect tabletop right here. Your hands are forward, or of course, if you bring your shoulders forward, your knees feel too far back. But that's okay, because for what we're doing, this is just fine. Now, we're gonna step our right foot forward. You might not get it all the way up to your starting line in one step. That's okay. We're gonna make in fewest steps possible by using your right hand on your ankle to guide the foot forward. Then lift your back knee. Looking at your back foot, look where the ball of the foot is planted on your mat. Imagine you're leaving a spot right there and that's where you're gonna place your heel. So your heel will go right there. Now this is going to be the long stance that you need for warrior one. You'll notice you used all body proportions. We don't talk about things in inches because what good is that if we've got someone who's six seven and someone else who's four nine in class? Instead, we use our own body proportions to determine a long stance. Then take your hands to your hips and rise. There's always the chance that you're not feeling stable or that you're overstretching your ankle or the outer part of your foot. If you keep your front knee aligned over your heel, then you've got to assess. Now, for example, I know that I'm a little overstretched in my back foot, so I'm gonna move it forward an inch. And that is just enough for me to be happy. So make your adjustments. Once you know your body, you can make these adjustments quicker in the process and lift your arms up and we'll find Virabhadrasana one, warrior one pose. Breathe here.
And then lower your hands, plant them on your starting line, fingertips on your starting line, lift your back heel. I shortened my stance, so I'm gonna move it back to its original long stance position. Step back to downward facing dog. For the purposes of this, lower your knees. We'll explore it with the knees lifted. But even if you know you have that in your practice, try this. You never know when you're going to have an injury or be recovering from something. And this is a good method to get you back on your mat a little sooner to learn how to modify. Lower your knees and then step your other foot forward. I'm gonna say left foot, hopefully I called that right. And align your toes with your starting line. Lift your back heel. Look back, or your back knee, look back and where the ball of your foot is, plant your heel. Align your right knee, or left knee rather, the front knee, right over your heel, hands to the hips and rise. Your heart will be facing forward. I'm not going to go too many into the details of this pose. We're really focusing on body proportions and efficiency today. Keep your knee over your heel. If you're feeling overstretched, shorten your stance and lift both arms high. Virabhadrasana or warrior one. Then replant your hands on your mat. You know where they go. Step back to your downward facing dog, your upside down V shape, lower your knees, bring your hips to your heels and rest in child's pose. Lift your head, reach your hands forward. So your arms are reaching forward, plant your hands. Let's just see where this takes us. Shall we a little experiment? So with your arms straight and your hands forward, lift, you should be in that long tabletop pose. The guys are coming out of the buggy pasture. Curl your toes under, lift your downward facing dog, and just to see how that sorted itself out, come forward into plank. All right, I've got a short, a length in my stance, an inch. And then back to down dog. So if you need to lower your knees for your step through, you can do that now. You can also, in as few steps possible, step your right foot forward and align it back to your starting line. I know that I can't do it one step perfectly, I end up about two inches short. Now this is important. Let's say that I took that step forward. I'm about two inches short, so I decide, oh, I'm gonna just take my hands back. My guess is that's not even a decision. That's just a reflex. But look it, now I'm not in a long stance anymore. What I really wanna do is from my down dog, and where am I in my down dog? Well, I'm gonna start and plank, find down dog. Then look forward and step my foot forward. It didn't quite make it. Rather than move my hands, I'm going to assist my foot forward or wriggle it forward until it finds the starting line. There I am, long stance. It's not a decision, it's just what is. It's just the efficient way to do it. Then plant the back foot right where the ball of the foot is. I know I need to shorten my stance a bit on this side because of an ankle injury. And bring your hands to your hips and rise. Lift your arms, warrior one. Now, for the sake of this practice, because we're doing a lot of work, but we also want to get a good practice in, lower your hands to your blocks, move your blocks back till they align with your front heel. Shorten your stance just a few inches, about three to four inches, and come all the way up to standing. So we're looking for our short stance again. Check that you are on railroad tracks rather than a balance beam. This means that your right foot is on one line and your left foot is on a parallel line with distance between the inner feet. We want the short stance that we found in our trikonasana earlier. Square your hips forward, 
then with a straight spine, begin to fold forward. The tendency here is for your right hip to start to drift forward, almost like you're going into a triangle pose. Resist that. Keep pulling your right hip back if you need to, if you can't quite get your hands on your blocks, support your upper body with your hands on your front leg. And then as your hamstring relaxes, as it feels comfortable, you can probably find your blocks eventually. Now, try to keep your spine as long as you can. Think about lifting your tailbone up towards the sky as you press your right heel down. And you might feel a pretty intense stretch in the front of your, in your right hamstring. That's what you're going for here. This is called pyramid pose. It's Parsvatanasana. Some of you have the ability with long hamstrings to lift your tailbone higher and thus come into a deeper fold. If you can do that with a long spine, go ahead. Remember, whatever shape you're creating in this pose, it's like a jello mold. This is the way you're molding your body. So if you tend to, for example, round your upper back like a camel kind of a hump, know that that's what you're forming. That's the shape you're creating. Instead, bring your shoulder blades together and create a long spine and fold from there. Just a few more breaths. And soften your front knee. Scoot your left foot back to your long stance. All right, let's take an experiment. Let's see where we end up. Move your blocks forward. Plant your hands, aligning them with your front toe right on your uh, starting line and then step back to plank pose, and then downward facing dog. It all should kind of come together effortlessly. Again, lower your knees if you need to for your step through. Otherwise, soften your knees, step your left foot forward, try to do it in as many steps or as few as steps as you can. Mine didn't quite make it, but I'm gonna scooch the foot forward and find my long stance. Shorten it a few inches. I know a few is kind of vague. So how about if I say six to eight inches again, and then where the ball of my foot is, plant the heel. Place my blocks right away so I don't have to find them once I stand. And then come all the way up to standing and straighten my legs. Sometimes you need to make some adjustments for your balance because even though our body proportions might indicate one thing, our injuries, our tightnesses, our weaknesses might require a little bit of extra, a little extra adjustments. We just try to minimize it. Then keep your spine long and fold. I'm not super flexible in my hamstrings, I don't know if that's really a fair thing to say. I'm as flexible as I am, but I have to support my upper body as I find my blocks in order to not round my spine. And then I can feel a really good, intense hamstring stretch in my left leg. And pause here with your legs straight. Take a few breaths in our pyramid pose. Now, lift slightly, soften your left knee. Move your blocks forward. Scoot your back foot back, lifting your heel so you're in your long stance again. Now, where do we put our hands? Well, there's not a lot of negotiation or, or decision making. We align our fingertips with our starting line. Step back to plank pose, and then downward facing dog. Lower your knees, bring your hips to your heels. Rest in your child's pose. Then sit up. 
So one part of a vinyasa that we do frequently is a plank, balakasana, to chaturanga, and then either to our belly for a nice easy cobra pose, or we keep our knees and our hips and our belly off the mat and come into an upward facing dog. For the purposes of this, we are gonna eventually make our way down to our belly and come into a cobra. Because even if you usually do the other way, the more challenging way up into an up dog, we're gonna be going slowly and you'll be expending more effort here. Come into tabletop. Actually, watch me for a moment. I'd like to demo this and then you'll get a chance. And I promise I won't make this too long because I know you want to move. We'll start in a basic tabletop with our fingertips on our starting line. Extend the left leg back, tuck the tailbone and extend the right leg back. Here I am in a good plank pose. Now I'm going to shift forward until my shoulders come past my fingertips and then lower so that, that my elbows form a 90 degree angle. So my upper arms are parallel to the mat. When I come all the way down, my heels of my hands should be about at my low ribs. Maybe you won't have grass in your face when you do this. All right, let's all do that together. Come into your tabletop. Extend your right leg back. Round your spine, this will activate your abdominals. Extend your left leg back, shift forward so that your shoulders come past your fingertips and then make your way all the way down to your belly. At this point, the heels of your hands should be right about your low ribs, directly underneath your elbows. Lift your heart. Come into your cobra pose, your back bend. Curl your toes under. Come to tabletop and then downward facing dog. Lower your knees. Sit back on your heels. I'd like to show you one more thing. So let's say for a moment that when you came through and you lowered, you didn't quite Bring your heels of your hands to the low ribs. And you found, oh, I've got to move them back in order to achieve that. So there might be something that you need to do a little extra to make that happen. From plank, come forward. And maybe you actually need to take a teeny step and then there you are, aha. And then an easy cobra and then perfectly situated for downward facing dog. Let's try that one more time. Once you know what you need to do, then you can continue to do that. There's a little bit of upfront experimentation that happens, but that's knowledge you take with you into your next yoga classes. And then it's always the same. So tabletop. Body proportion, set this up. Your shoulders come right over your wrists and your knees are right beneath your hips. Extend, round, support your low back. Extend your other leg, shift forward. If you need to, take a little bit more of a step. Hover if you can in your chaturanga to build strength. Make your way to your belly. Lift your cobra. Curl your toes under. Pause for a moment in tabletop. You'll notice that you're here in your longer tabletop again. If I bring my shoulders over my wrists, my knees feel behind me. If I bring my hips back, my wrists feel ahead of me. But that's okay, because that's perfect proportions for downward facing dog. Let's take one more practice, and for those of you that have a vinyasa practice and want to practice with your up dog as a version, you have a second to do that here. So come forward, bend, and then never touch the hips or the belly down, and make your way back to downward facing dog. Then everyone lower your knees, we'll meet in child's pose. Bring your hands under your shoulders 
lift yourself up to seated. So even though we just did a few repetitions of those chaturangas, they may have felt pretty intense. Let's stretch our shoulders and our triceps. So bring yourself to a, um, a tabletop, but now in the center of your mat and reach your hands forward as far as you comfortably can. Mine come right to the very edge of the mat. Stretch your hips back. Let your forehead rest on the mat if it reaches, it can hover, but feel as though your heart is descending towards the mat. Lift your shoulders, lower your elbows down, Prayer your hands. Check that your elbows are a little bit closer maybe than shoulder distance, just an inch. And this time as you bring your hips towards your heels, bend your elbows and bring your thumbs to the nape of your neck. And your intention here is to stretch the triceps. When we come into our chaturangas, the triceps, which are kind of underused muscles for a lot of us, really need to work hard. So we'll do this to avoid being super sore tomorrow. Place your hands on the mat ahead of you. Lift back into tabletop. Move your hands back so that you find your steady balanced tabletop position. Slide your right arm underneath your left arm. Lower your shoulder and the side of your face to the mat. Deepen your breath and draw your breath up into your upper right lung so you feel a stretch around your right shoulder blade. Now keep everything as it is. This next bit's an option, so if anything doesn't feel right, just come back to this pose right here. Otherwise, extend your left leg out to the left like a kickstand. So your left leg and your right arm are parallel to each other. Tuck your chin to your chest, turn your gaze up. So you have a flexion in your neck. And as you turn your gaze up, you're looking at your left shoulder and the back of your head is on your mat. Press your left hand down to lift your upper body up. Let's keep our leg extended to the side. One more time, walk your hands forward and stretch your hips back. Some people call this a happy puppy pose. I like this because I feel a big opening in the right rib cage area. And if you tilt your tailbone up, you might feel a stretch in your left inner thigh as well. Now lift your shoulders, walk your hands back underneath your shoulders again, draw your left leg in. Let's repeat that to the other side. You can stay right where you are. I'm just gonna turn my body so I don't have my back to you and slip your left arm underneath your right and lower your shoulder and the side of your face down to the mat. It's okay to stay right here. But if you'd like to get a little deeper neck stretch, if that suits you today, extend your right leg out to the right, tuck your chin towards your chest, turn your gaze up towards your right uh, shoulder. Remember your neck is in flexion, so you feel like your chin is actually maybe touching your right pectoral. Breathe. Deep breaths always help to facilitate stretch. At the very least, they help relax you, and muscles that aren't relaxed, of course, will never stretch. And then press 
back your up to your tabletop with your upper body. Keep your leg extended. Walk your hands forward. Stretch your hips back and feel your stretch maybe in your left rib cage area. Tilt your tailbone up so that your right inner thigh may have a stretch as well. Lift your shoulders, walk your hands back so that they're right underneath your shoulders again. This time, sweep your right leg back, curl your toes under on the floor. Round your spine, extend your left leg back, shift forward. Now modification here, you can do this straight legged, you can also lower your knees and make your way all the way down to your belly. Then bend your right knee and reach back and take a hold of your ankle or your foot. Keep tucking your pubic bone deep into the mat. That might be enough to get the stretch in your quadricep, but if you need more, pull your heel towards your hip. Release your right ankle, bend your left knee. Same thing, take a hold of your foot or the ankle, press your pubic bone deep into the mat and pull your heel in towards your hip. Bend both knees. Take a hold of both feet now. Press your pubic bone down into the mat. This is gonna help keep your low back long. Bring your shoulder blades together and down the mat. And as you inhale, lift your thighs, lift your heart off the mat. Down your asana, bow pose. Lower. Release your feet, stack your hands. Take a moment just to rest. We'll do one more. Option here, if you cannot comfortably grab your feet or if anything bothers you, say knees, you can certainly just bend your knees, take your hands back and lift here and make this more strengthening. Otherwise, grab your ankles and feet, press your pubic bone down, Lift your shoulder blades, draw them together, and then lift your upper body, your chest, and your thighs off your mat. And release. Release your feet. Hello. Bring your hands under your shoulders. Lift up to tabletop. I don't think you're supposed to be comfortable there. Let's come seated. Well, hello there. It's hot, huh? So just bring your feet forward. Support your upper body with your hands behind you. Open your feet to the outer edges of your mat and just take some gentle windshield wipers with the knees, dropping them one side and the other. Come back to center. Plant your feet on the mat. Bring your right ankle to your left knee. You can draw your left heel as close to you as you can. So some of you might get much closer. I'm gonna take a little further away today because I don't feel like slouching and just find an opening in your right hip. Lower your right foot, bring your left ankle to your right knee. Same stretch. And lower your foot. We're moving towards our Shavasana but we'll take one reclining twist now to help open up the low back 
from the uh, bow pose that we did. So come on to your back. Here's another way you can use your body proportions to determine where your feet are placed. Extend your arms by your sides, and when you do, you should just be able to brush your heels with your fingertips. And when I say just, they might even be like an inch away. You have to reach for them. That usually ends up being a really good place for your feet. For the purposes of this, have your inner legs, your inner feet touching. Open your arms like a T with your palms facing up. Move your hips a few inches to the right. Just lift them, move them to the right, and place them back on your mat. Draw your knees close to your chest. Drop your knees over towards your left elbow. Now, depending on how tight you are, there's a lot of places you might feel a stretch here. The first and most obvious, the one we're going for, is opening up your right low back. But there's a potential to also feel a stretch in your right chest. Don't worry if your shoulder blade lifts off the mat. That's fine. Relax your legs. Let them sink heavy into the ground, into the earth. But if your right shoulder blade raises, just try to relax it. Use that as an opportunity for stretch. Another thing that you might find is important, if you have a tight hip and IT band, you can try extending your top leg straight and taking a hold of your right big toe with your left hand. That can be a nice stretch as well. Rebend your knee if you've extended it. And then come out of your twist, lowering both of your hips down to the mat, and then rebalance. All right, let's start from scratch again. Heels close to your hips. Open your arms like a T. Lift your hips, move them offset a few inches to the left. Draw your knees into your chest and drop both of your knees over to the right. Relax. You try to get your knees on the mat, but if they don't quite touch down, you can always use a block underneath them. Don't worry if your left shoulder is lifting away from the ground. Just relax it. Use that as an opportunity for stretch. And if you'd like to extend your left leg towards straight, you can do that too. Intensifying the stretch in your hip and IT band. So lots of, of opportunities here in this pose. This pose packs a lot of punch. Rebend your knee. Come back to knees up, coming out of the twist. Now, I've got Sprout on my mat, so I'm going to work my Shavasana around her a little bit. If you've got company on your mat, you'll need to do the same thing because yoga is always a practice in kindness and patience, right? As you situate yourself for Shavasana, which is that final resting pose, remember that this pose is an opportunity for us to sort of process everything that happened in our practice doesn't mean you have to think about it or interpret it or analyze it. Let your mind be quiet and your body be quiet as well for the next few moments.
Begin to deepen your breath. Bring some movement into your hands and to your feet. Make any larger movements that feel good. And then bend both of your knees, roll on to one side. Keeping your eyes closed, press yourself up into seated. Bring your palms together at the heart. Give yourself a deep inner bow for attending to your practice. And I thank you for sharing your efforts and your energy with me. Namaste. So I hope that you felt that efficiency in the practice, how placing everything in exactly the same spot, knowing where it goes, saves you from a lot of fidgeting and fussing. Um, and thinking about doing that in our daily life can be helpful. There's that one um, kind of a rule, I don't know if rule is the right word, but to handle things, objects in your house one time. So for example, if you have a hook that you always hang your keys on, instead of walking in the house, tossing it on the table or on the couch, your keys, and then later having to come back and put them on the hook, you do it right away. Yes, do I do that all the time? No, but I can work at that and develop more efficiency in my movements so that I'm not expending a lot of energy. Certainly losing my keys expends a lot of energy. So I hope that this practice was helpful and I hope that this is something that you can continue to keep in mind um, in your vinyasa flow until it becomes second nature and then you really begin to feel the beauty of the economy of the movement, um, placing everything carefully and deliberately. Thank you for practicing with me, and I hope that this was helpful. Namaste.